What I think of as violence has changed throughout my life. When people talk about a sport being violent, I can't even associate the word with violence. People might say, you know, fighting in a cage, mixed martial arts is violent. People are punching each other, kicking each other, choking each other. There's a referee there. It's not violent at all. I think when, when your head's removed from your body, I think when people stab you, people shoot you, your body comes apart, you get blown up, um, you kill children because they go to school, I think that's violent. Violence has always been part of my life. I've been in street fights, lost friends to gang violence and family to war. As a nation, violence is justified, demonised and glorified. I want to explore violence, but to do so, I need to understand our relationship to it. State-sanctioned violence is probably the most offensive and publicised form of violence, but it's also the most applauded. Sergeant Paul Cale is a Special Forces soldier and a founding member of the 2nd Commando Regiment, a unit that's seen more violence and casualties than any other branch of the Australian Defence Force. In 2013, Paul made headlines when he stormed an enemy compound and strangled a Taliban leader. Since then, Paul has developed an instinctive model for close quarter combat that he teaches to elite special forces around the world. Paul's built a career on state sanctioned violence, so we're going to unpack what that feels like. Chapman, good to meet you. Yeah, same, same. Honored to meet you. What are you guys doing here? Uh, the idea is to use combat sports, so it's a related fitness to combat, but it's not combat. I can use techniques and skills like understanding balance and control of my body, which relates to combat but in a sporting context. The body doesn't identify one stress from another. So I've got to learn how to put the body under stress and how to put soldiers under stress. I would have thought that the way, because the violence isn't in itself real, it's kind of simulated, mm. that you'd have to almost overdo that kind of... It's the opposite. Yeah, because right. what will happen is I'll just overwhelm you with, with violence. If you're overwhelmed, you won't do anything. You'll just become... Scared. Prey. You'll have a fear for violence. I don't want you to have a fear for violence, I want you to thrive in violence. I want you to treat it as if it's ordinary. All right, well, I'm, I'm going to choke out the presenter now. Want to be the first time? <laughs> Won't be the last. <laughs> right, come on in, mate. Just jump down on your knees. Yeah. I'm lifting myself up here. Up, hook. Okay. I want to try and cut this angle and then choke. There you go. Do you want to fall unconscious? No. It's funny. It's funny. It'll be great for the camera. You won't die. Come on, you trust me? Yeah, go on. Okay, go on. You'll, feel like, you'll feel like you just went to sleep. I love strangling people. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Good work. Gives me a bit of a, bit of a head spin. You feel great. Yeah. Oh, I love it. <laughs> feels like feels like you've had a sleep for yeah, like a, a like month. a while. Yeah. 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 You kind of go, wow, that was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to do some uh, close quarter battle, so we'll move around this space tactically. All my guys are special forces. Go long. Could you tell me a bit about your childhood growing up in a neighbourhood right near mine in Cranbourne? What was that like? Uh, it was terrible. <laughs> my, my family was uh, not well to do. Uh, that wasn't a problem for me, but uh, that led to a lot of um, being picked on with not understanding why, dealing with uh, a lot of bullies um, targeting me each day at school. And I look forward to, I guess, not being there, which is the reason I joined the army. I knew that it would extract me straight out of Cranbourne and I would end up somewhere else. As I went through school, I was, I was never good at running, so I thought I'd better learn how to fight because they keep catching me. 
So I took up martial arts. I had a goal to get a black belt. It was a, it was a simple goal, I must get a black belt. It just kept rolling over. And then I thought when I'm older, I'll join the army and understand about modern warfare. I'll understand how it, how it applies today. What was it about fighting that you felt like you needed so much? You only have to be beaten up every day of your life to, to be sick of it. All these solutions I hear about bullying means nothing to me. The solution to bullying is learn how to stop bullies. How and do you so stop bullies? You talk to them in the same language they speak. The first time I was violent towards a bully, I was never bullied again. The child ended up unconscious and, you know, he could have been badly hurt. I, I harmed him. Violence is a shocking thing. It's, uh, that's why terrorists use it. I'm doing something so that you change your behaviour. But in a way you're playing their game and you're fighting fire with fire, aren't you? Yep. That's the way forward? Your yep. experience has dictated that that's, that's the way to get a solution? Well, I'm not going to get a solution by telling you that that's not the way to go. Mm. Do you think you'll get a solution out of me by telling me that's not the way to go? In the military, the whole political jargon is winning the hearts and minds of everyone, you know, and it's this No, 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 no. That's not what the military's for. Mm. That's a job the military does. Could you tell us about a time you had to make a really sharp judgment call? We ended up in a Taliban village. When entering the village, we were blown up several times by remote controlled IEDs. And uh, there was a guy watching us, but he was just watching us like a spectator. And he had a phone running through my head how this happened, how we've been uh, blown up. I just thought to myself, he's, he's here for one reason. So I decided that I was going to kill him. I aimed at him, he looked at me and he, you know, we didn't speak the same language, but I could tell he was sort of like, are you going to shoot me? And I'm, yeah, I'm going to shoot you. And I shot him and took my suppressor off. And basically that was that. It turned out that he was in fact Taliban and there was in fact uh, ID present. But it's an odd thing because for me, it's not a hate, there's a want to end bad people, but it's not in a way that you wish to torture them. Probably the first time I actually thought about it like that. You want to end evil people, but you don't want to become evil in doing so. Paul Cale embodies the necessary function of state-sanctioned violence. To gain an objective insight into the role of the military, I wanted to speak to Professor Kevin Foster, whose critical research focuses on the nature of conflict. No military that worth its name can forget that it's in the business of delivering force. We've come to think of militaries as being a bit warmer and cuddlier. So violence is central to what they do and who they are. How violent is the war in Afghanistan? It's, I think, been much more violent than we've been led to understand. The public are pretty ignorant about what actually goes on in um, a war zone and, and militaries have been active in ensuring that that remains the case. Is there any merit to state sanctioned violence? There is a place for state sponsored violence. So I'm, I'm afraid to say, it'd be nice if there weren't, but that's not the world we live in. Um, and so it's, we need to have those resources there when we need them. At the other extreme, you don't want to be you know, turning to your military every five minutes. I think it is important that there is a proper debate about the circumstances in which state-sponsored violence should be used, and that we don't currently have the mechanisms for that within our system. It's that the Prime Minister's discretion currently or the discretion of the Cabinet. The thing I remember the most was uh, an Afghan family. And we're cruising along and they had their camels and their, their animals with them. And so they're moving slowly. We're going slowly as well because we're clearing the route from IEDs. Then we settled down for the night and they sort of settled off over the side. They left in the morning and we heard an explosion. And we saw it and we thought, well, we better go investigate. Then we heard another explosion. One of their camels hit an IED, which was set for us. And uh, one of the sons grabbed the other camels to get it away and then he stepped on an IED, which blew him apart. And by the time we got there, his father's picking his son up. His son's children are there. And they're crying, but those little children have work to do. You don't have time to stop because you've got to get the 
the equipment off the dead camel. Cry while you're working. We just spent the day picking up pieces of human flesh and we got a body bag and we'd start collecting pieces of body so that they could bury their son that night because of Islamic religion. But his eyes, the eyes of that father looking at me, it's just, uh, that's the most, the worst thing that I can think of. And then that night, the, they set the grave up and stones and then the mother was just wailing at night time. And so all you could hear at night was her wailing at the grave. The role of the Special Forces in Afghanistan was to negate uh, the Taliban leadership uh, and Taliban bomb makers and Taliban recruiters, Taliban middle management, if you like. That's a violent job. How effective do you think violence has been in the Australian war in Afghanistan? I don't think it's been effective at all. In 2013, 2014, as more and more of the country was taken back by or came under the sway of the Taliban again. You really basically had a ring around Kabul and beyond that it's manifestly unsafe. The Taliban might have lost lots of battles but they appear to be on the brink of, well not necessarily as victors but certainly having got considerably more than we, than we got out of it. Do you think violence has failed the military in the war in Afghanistan? The military recognise themselves when they move from a more more of the kind of decapitation policy to a counterinsurgency policy. The fact that they were able to recognise that they needed to, to move beyond shooting and bombing to a much more genuine engagement with the people and their leaders and a much more genuine engagement with the culture was a very healthy sign. There's a place for violence and there's a place where you actually need other tools of persuasion. When a body's lifeless, it's like a sandbag, it just slumps and the limbs just hang or they're missing or they're bent up the back that it's just a slumped over piece of flesh. Do you get much sleep? No, I don't sleep much. Can't you tell? <laughs> I don't have nightmares or anything. I just don't sleep. When I do sleep, it's no problem. It's, it's good, but uh, yeah, you, you, you need some medication to help knock you out sometimes. But I'm busy, so I don't like being sort of too knocked out. So sometimes I just get three or four hours sleep and off I go. We all lose a, a piece of ourselves over there, but you mend that and the end product can probably be better than what you started with. <laughs>